Good morning. Good morning. I, um, I said if we had the first four rows uh, filled up, I would be delighted. This is uh, overwhelming. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, yeah, a lot of people snuck in the back door, so it didn't fill in. Um, we really appreciate um, all of you taking the time to come out. And let me tell you what this is. Um, obviously, we do campus talks and things like that throughout the year where a variety of people will give updates on things. We um, were talking heading into the board meeting that, and some of you participate in the board meetings. You come and, um, and you, uh, you, you come and uh, watch the presentations. You maybe even you know, enter in some dialogue while you're in the room. But that's a pretty <laughs> formal presentation. It's pretty high level. It's, it's sort of, yeah, big picture budget, but it rarely gets to what does this actually mean? Does that make sense? So we thought we might do a Campus Talk Budget Edition, um, that uh, was the name we came up with, to really have what's today meant to be a fairly informal walk through some of the same information that the board saw and approved just a few days ago. Um, and for us to be able to give you a little bit of an update and a glimpse into how's that actually going to affect July 1. Well, what does that mean as we're kind of looking toward next year and planning toward July 1 of 2019? Um, what does that have to say about a multi-year plan uh, to deal with faculty and salaries? Because there's a, a checker move that happens in this year that's related to a bunch of checker moves as we go forward in the next four or five years. So today, Diane and I are going to do this a little bit of tag team style. Um, I think that uh, in, in some ways she's the play-by-play -play and I'm the color commentator um, <laughs> at, at best. Uh, but we'll probably go back and forth a little bit. Um, she is largely presenting the same slide deck that the board saw last week, but again, it'll have that, that filter uh, and instead of in a very public, uh, formal sort of presentation. We'll just try and get down in the weeds a little bit um, on each of the slides and talk about what they mean. So with that, let's kind of run through. Um, I'm gonna hit on the first couple of slides because it really isn't the 10,000 foot view, but let me give you what I hope um, is, is a little better uh, translation of these things. And we're going to do our best to get out of here in the hour, but what we want to do is work through, and please stop us if you have questions. It would be easier as we go along if there's something that's not clear to go ahead and raise your hand um, and let's deal with that, but we'll take plenty of questions at the end. We talk a lot about cautious optimism. Um, you don't have to look very far right now in the newspapers um, about some of the budget struggles that some of our sister institutions um, are having around the state. And it's not so uncommon, uh, if you're a Chronicle reader or inside higher ed, some of the same struggles that a lot of public and private institutions are having around the country. Um, especially as institutions' uh, enrollment uh, begins to shrink, um, any sort of dip in enrollment uh, really can you know, set off a crisis situation in terms of your overall budget plan. We see a lot um, in the upward trajectory of UCA, uh, for instance, I, you've heard me talk about last fall, we were very pleased to see uh, the number of freshmen uh, tick up a bit. We were pleased to see the number of transfers tick up in a positive direction. We were pleased to see the number of graduate students tick up in a solid uh, sort of trajectory on the positive side. But we had to balance that with the fact that we knew that we had a couple of years where our freshman classes had been smaller than historically, so that means we will have smaller sophomore classes, smaller junior classes, smaller senior classes. It's the opposite of a bubble um, that's working its way through UCA. So we can have growth in our freshman class again this year, uh, modest increases, and we're seeing in housing um, applications. We saw in the applications uh, for general enrollment to the university that new first-time freshman numbers are up. But there's always that, what does that mean about what our returning sophomore, junior, and senior uh, numbers look like? Uh, so cautious optimism is going to have to carry the day, at least probably for three budget cycles. I told everybody I needed to see positive last fall, I need to see positive this coming fall, and probably positive two falls from now before I'm going to take a deep breath and feel like we've turned the corner from those two years of smaller than historically normal uh, freshman classes. Um, we know that as we're making decisions with the scarce dollars that we have, that we absolutely have to stay focused on some of the priorities that have been developed over the last six, seven years here at UCA, especially those that are focused on the student success initiatives. 
Um, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are some very meaningful steps that have been taken to address uh, gaps in student services, to be able to target um, academic um, and, and non-academic supports for students, that those are not things that you do for one year and then it yields results. Those are things that you're committed to across multiple cycles because you're trying to change a culture of supports that surround um, students. Uh, those are things that we very much have remained committed to and we want to make certain that, again, that, that emanates ultimately from the strategic plan, so we want to stay there. Um, obviously, we have to maintain stable reserves. It's always easy in the short term to say, well, you know, let's go grab a little money out of that pot. Um, we'll go ahead and do that in the short run and we'll roll the dice. You didn't hire that kind of president. I know we don't have that kind of CBO. Um, we have to make certain that we keep an eye on stable reserves because rainy days absolutely come. Um, and you've got to have a rainy day fund for your rainy day fund. So uh, looking to that uh, is very important. And then we also can't take on the tact well, let's just jack up tuition and fees for students. Uh, the reality is we still serve a lot of first-generation college students. We serve a lot of students um, who do not have disposable family income to just respond to, hey, look, fees have gone up by $750 or fees have gone up by $1,200. That's no big deal. Well, when you're poor, that's a lot of money. When you're poor, that can be the difference between going to college and not going. We have to be mindful um, that what we offer here at UCA has a great education, uh, but we've been able to maintain a high level of value because we've maintained that at an affordable price point throughout our 111 years history. Um, we can't lose sight of that as we head into a decade um, in which we know that though there's declining state support, we cannot just pass along everything to students. It's the importance of fundraising and it's the importance of us making certain to reallocate. Um, the student success initiatives, as I mentioned, were some things that we outlined to the board um, as front and center, and we're going to try and get kind of unpack some things as we go through this presentation and actually name um, some of those, uh, those items. The technology refresh uh, that Mr. Mike Lloyd and his team um, in IT um, are leading. There was at least the opportunity, and we'll talk about what the tuition freeze versus the ability to be able to target some dedicated student fees. What's that? has meant to at least a couple of areas of the university that we've all collectively named um, as priorities in need of resources. Uh, the uh, rising facilities cost as we've taken on new square footage, um, those, uh, there, there's a maintenance effort that's expected by the state on anything that has debt against it, but then there's also the, again, it's short-term uh, short versus long-term interest. We cannot let our overall capital uh, go. We cannot um, allow deferred maintenance um, to get out of control, um, or again, you, you lose, in the, you went, might win in the short term, but you lose in the long term. Um, we've got some pretty significant market compression issues that have to be dealt with. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how market and equity, uh, the dialogue with our board, is about not thinking that that's going to get fixed overnight, but that we've got to have a plan, and not just a plan, we've got to have action uh, that's in support of that plan talk about how that's playing out, and then maximizing the scholarship options. Um, as we have continued to see the profile of our incoming class go up, uh, we continue uh, to have more and more of our students that meet the minimums uh, for established scholarship programs. And certainly, uh, we have to be mindful of, of sister institutions and, and being competitive in the marketplace. We have to be smart um, about how we're targeting those dollars and what do we expect in terms of performance uh, by the students that are in play. So with that, I'm going to ask Diane uh, to kind of walk through uh, the budget components that were presented to the board the other day. Diane. Okay, thank you, Chris. President Davis. I'm going to take a Okay, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for all being here. I mean, 
this uh, speaks volumes to this kind of crowd coming for a budget talk. So uh, for accounting nerds, this is kind of impressive. So, <laughs> so where are we now? Okay, so um, I'm going to flip mine over here a little bit so I don't have to turn around backwards every time because I'm going to have a lot of things to talk about. Okay, so uh, we talked about some of the initiatives uh, that President uh, just mentioned. Uh, how we're going to pay for that. Uh, we've got a lot of things we know we always need to take care of. So the first thing that um, that we know that uh, that we were going to be able to, well, first of all, let me start with, uh, as you're aware, the governor uh, put a restriction on us this year. He requested that, um, that we not increase the tuition line. Uh, but he did allow some flexibility on the fees. So what that did is it really gave us an opportunity uh, to look at our fee structure because um, usually when we increase tuition, we'll, we'll do the majority of it in that tuition line because what that does is it, um, it gives us more flexibility on how the money is spent. And so we haven't really paid that much attention to the fees and the fees in particular, the fees that we're gonna be talking about. Um, so, what are, how are we going to do this budget? How are we going to fund it? Well, one thing we've got is a fee increase of 2.66. That's really the total tuition and fees, mandatory fees together, is the 2.66% increase. But we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, about what those particular fees are. Uh, we also, uh, oh, these are basically our assumptions, and uh, we're basing it, like the President said, on flat enrollment. Um, I'm, I'm not one to budget for growth because you never know if you're going to get it or not. And it's much easier to let money relax than it is to pull it back. And then we did um, manage to do really well on the, pro the new productivity funding for the first year. So we were able to get an additional $531,000 on our base money. Uh, an additional uh, $64,000 on one-time money. So that's going to go a long way in what we we're going to be able to do and what we we're going to be able to do with... Uh, maybe I'll be able to talk better. Oh, <laughs> I'll just use this. Okay, we'll just, we'll just make do. So we know the assumptions, how we're going to do the budget. We're going to increase um, some of the fees and the fees only, and we're targeting those fees to the areas that need those strategic goals. Um, and we're basing it on flat enrollment and state funding, additional state funding, and we're really pleased to be able to get that additional 531,000 plus the 64 because that's going to enable us to do a few things that we can't do with the fee money because the fee money is going toward certain, certain places. So let's talk about these fees. The first one, I think first and foremost, that I should have put it first, was the technology refresh. I think everybody in this room knows what problem we have with our technology base and how because we have historically underfunded it, um, we just let it go and haven't paid that much attention to it. And I know there's a lot of folks in uh, IT here saying, yeah, <laughs> we've been trying to tell you that. So it got to a point that we knew we had to do something. Uh, our ability to provide the product that we provide and provide the, um, uh, in the, um, the students with what they need depended on this. So the middle one is the technology fee. Now, um, these are based on where the other schools are this current year. So you'll see in the middle, UCA was at 750 per credit hour. We were at the bottom end. So that tells you something. And it helps, 
it helps tell the story about what, how we got to where we are on our technology. So, yes, sir. Let me, uh, some of you, especially faculty senate, staff senate, and some other uh, groups that we talked about coming off of the technology uh, review in the fall, there was an observation made that our overall spending for technology, that team looked and they measured it two different ways, whether it was looking at our peer institutions on a per FTE expenditure, or looking at it, if I remember correctly, it's per $1,000 of your overall budget. We were in the lower quartile of our peer institutions, and that wasn't just Arkansas, that was um, in this region of the country. It was no surprise uh, when we started doing the analysis of what if other institutions were. Our students, our faculty, our staff have been getting what we've been paying for. Does that make sense? So when the governor made the request of the institutions about holding tuition flat, this was one of the examples that I gave him about why we needed to at least have some flexibility on the fees because we knew that we were developing a plan to begin making some progress um, in terms of moving forward. There are several areas where the peer review team, and I think that Mike and his team have observed this uh, since January, were a couple of generations behind peer institutions in terms of the infrastructure and the supports that were available. We're not going to close that gap um, in one year, but we've got to make a significant down payment on that problem um, and on addressing those issues. So again, being targeted in a year where we do have some constraints, this was one area where every data point, including that middle one on the chart above you, said that we probably were under-investing. Um, money doesn't solve everything, okay? I'm not saying that you have to go up to the top of that middle chart uh, to be able to be successful and be effective, but we know that when every other indicator says that we're in the bottom quartile, if not here, very bottom, um, we know that we probably have a deficiency in terms of overall effort and capacity. So again, targeted investments this year is what we're trying to do and being smart within the capabilities that we have uh, at the state level. So I can say also that while we did move up a little bit uh, with our uh, increase, other, there are at least a couple of other schools who have also um, turned to investing more in their technology base as well. So another, another one that we're doing is a facilities fee. And again, you can see where we are compared to all the others. Um, in the state, well, you know, we haven't we haven't increased this fee in a number of years, it's at least since I've been here, and it was probably a number of years before that. And we put a lot of square footage on this campus, um, and with new square footage, with, with new buildings, it's not just the money that has to go into a reserve that's required by the Department of Higher Education, but it's also the needs of uh, custodians. You've got to have someone in there cleaning it. You've got to have someone looking, checking out the HVAC systems. You have to have someone taking care of the grounds that are around that building. So the cost and the utilities. The utilities. You, you add a 50,000 square foot building and you're going to have additional utilities. So there are costs directly associated with every building. We've not increased that facility fee. And so we felt like, well, if we can't do other things, uh, that we'd like to do, like colas and, and other things like that, at least we can make some targeted investments in our facilities as well as the technology. Um, and then another area that's not up here, because I, I want to stay with ENG first, um, and the reason it's done up there is because there's not a way to really compare our student success fee with others in the state. And the reason is because everybody calls that something different. And what they pay for out of that fee, it varies greatly. So we didn't put that as a chart um, because we couldn't really pick out um, an apple to an apple there. But we do have a student success fee, and it was 35 cents an hour. And what we did is we felt like um, that that was an opportunity to look at some of our strategic investments that we're looking at. Uh, we know that we needed um, uh, note takers for the students with disabilities. We knew we needed to increase a Hispanic uh, and Latino recruiter and a liaison position from part time to full time. Uh, we knew we had several of these several of these areas out there that we needed to address, and we needed to find money to be able to do that. But we also had. Um, a new initiative coming online is the need-based aid office, 
We have a lot of opportunities for um, students who have a need for that last five hundred dollars to pay their uh, to pay their bills, so that they don't get kicked out of school, um, or that they can, you know, buy the books that they need to buy, or or whatever. So we have um, we, what we've done is we've pulled all these different areas together. We have what we call the APSEC, and it's the scholarship for students with uh, uh, exceptional circumstances. Uh, we have several things like that that are for students who are, that we consider these deep based. So we pulled all those together into one office, and John Fincher, I don't know if you're in here, but, um, but it's, it's in his area. And so we needed to fund some efforts to go along with that office as well. So by going from 35 cents to a dollar, it gave us about $195,000. And so that is going to fund all of these initiatives. And it also includes success coach in the uh, Student Success Center. So we feel really good about what we're doing with these targeted fees, um, things that we might not have gotten done if we hadn't had to focus directly on just the fees. Um, so then the, we have another one up there uh, that goes to auxiliary services, and that's the student health fee. Now, the student health fee is currently at $65 a semester, and that's what it was when the building was built. So we know that the, that the needs of our students have increased, the cost of health care has increased, um, and we really needed to, to make a move on that. So we moved from 65 to 75 on that, and that generates about $100,000. So um, technology fee is 1.35, is what that hopefully estimated uh, generation will be. And the facility fee is estimated to bring in about five, um, 525,000. Okay, so what's all this gonna pay for? Well, the fees aren't gonna pay for anything on this chart, on this slide. These are things that we felt like we needed to do but we couldn't raise tuition to do it. So how are we doing it? Well, we got the, the 531,000 plus the 64, the 597 is what that is, or 596. So we had that money that we could, that we could um, put against these needs, but that didn't go very far. So then we knew we had to, we had to um, maybe true up some budgets. There were some budgets that we had not um, and when I say true it up, I mean um, maybe the revenue budget was set at $100 and maybe for the last three years we've brought in 125 So we increased that budget and what that did is it gave us um, budget capability on the expense side. So when we did that, that brought in, um, Terry's here, uh, how much? About seven hundred thousand, a little over seven hundred thousand dollars. So we had the five ninety six from the state money, the seven hundred thousand. So let's see what we're going to be able to do with it. The first thing we knew we had to do was faculty promotion and advancement. That has to happen. That's contractual, and we have two hundred twenty five thousand dollars in in that category. And I'm sorry, part is good. Two people can't talk at once. Um, and that's a good example. That five hundred and sixty-three thousand dollars from the state, almost fifty percent of it is immediately gobbled up by something that's in contracts that we have to pay for. I mean, in the end, I get it that a thousand dollars and ten thousand dollars and a hundred thousand dollars a lot of money, but the reality in a big budget like ours, five hundred and sixty-three thousand. And again, we're appreciative to have it. Um, we're very glad to maximize what um, was available and what UCA could get through the new formula. But that $563 is peanut butter that's spread pretty thinly um, upon the brand. I mean, the reality is it's that internal reallocation that's allowing us to even begin to address some of the other things that are down this list. Okay, so there we went to the um, market compression issue that we have. Um, it was our hope that we could put more money against this if we had been able to do a tuition increase, but we weren't. Um, and so we were very limited on what we could put toward this. So we have $125,000. It doesn't sound like a, like a lot, but what we're hoping to do is look at that group of people who are below 70% of 
of the average of whatever we're um, whatever we're comparing them to in terms of PUPA. Well, let me say something about this because there have been a lot of conversations about the market and equity. Um, one of the things that we've attempted to do during the last year is to start a dialogue with the board and then also a dialogue with the campus about the fact that this is something that we are not going to solve in one, two, or three years. It's going to take probably four to five years because let me give you some sense. I want to, I'm always the glass is half full. So I want to look at that 125,000 through my Houston's always positive glass is half full lens. But we know on an estimate, when you look at faculty, classified and non-classified positions, our market and equity adjustments to get everyone to 100% of a target, if we can get to the point where our model, we feel confident in that, is probably between five and six million dollars, okay? Even to get those three buckets of employees to 90%, we think is probably in the neighborhood of two and a half to three million, okay? But what we've tried to do with the board is say, we've got to start somewhere. Let's start working a plan. Um, and I was very glad that they at least, and it was something that a couple of the board members spoke to, although this is a small amount, if we can begin working on, I, although there are limitations, I think on the, the faculty data, if I remember correctly, we're one year in arrears. It's a 2016 um, academic year. Uh, the numbers. On the, the non-classified, I think there's not perfect matches on some percentage. It might be 10 to 15 percent of positions that we weren't able to get to a perfect match utilizing Arkansas peers in Cuba. Uh, with regard to classified positions, we sort of have to look at the classified um, pay scales, um, you know, at, at the state level. We're, we're having to use proxies, but what we want to do, and this is, this is the promise that I make in front of all of you guys and I've told the board, I do not want to create a pool of money that can just go randomly to people that are either friends, you know, squeaky wheels, um, the department that just seems to make the most noise about it. What I want to be able to do is say that for our faculty, for our non-classified, and for our classified positions, that we've at least tried to get to a systematic approach to be able to look and say that Mike is, based on the best information that we have, is at 73% um, of his target, and Michael is at 78% at um, of his target. So, or, well, that's Mike and Michael, that's a bad example. <laughs> um, anyway, um, but what we want to do is be able to say that with scarce monies available, we need to try and get to the 73% before we worry about the 78%. Does that make sense? Um, and then everything that's happened with market compression, as new people have hired in, you benefit from the fact that you've been in a market arrangement in terms of getting to a salary negotiation with the department that's hired you. So we've got some people in terms of that overall analysis that are over 100%. I mean, the market compression that happens in a department is sometimes you'll have a new faculty member that's hired in that's making more than several senior faculty members uh, that have been there for a period of time. So we have got to work toward a systematic approach to begin making those adjustments and begin making some gains, knowing that this $125,000, it might allow us to only get to the handful of people that by our best estimates are below 70% or below 75%. Um, but at least it's a down payment on something that we want to go back to the board and say, all right, we've broken the seal on that. If we do have any enrollment growth in this next year, what are we talking about for July 1st of 2019 to maybe make a significant um, down payment on that, to really start making some headway, knowing that that is a four to five year plan. In Georgia, this was something that we required of every university. Anytime they were gonna have, it, it didn't matter if they had $50,000 to put to their, their market and equity plans. Um, we would be, all right, well, how are you gonna distribute that? Are you gonna try and make certain to target maybe the lowest paid employees first? Um, are you, uh, how does that fit within, how's that $50,000 go against what you did last year and what you need to do in year three of that? I want us to get to the point where at least there is a plan and there are actions that are following that plan, um, knowing that this is a drop in the bucket. And again, half full, I don't know if I can get there. What's in between half full and half empty? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that term exists. Anyway. Okay, so we also had some uh, other salary needs that we needed to address. For example, uh, there were two OT professors that have been in the um, 
and the plan to put into the budget because we're expanding that program. So we had to do that. Uh, there was a, a College of Business replacement position that we had to get back in the budget that had been pulled out. Um, there was replacement funding for some economic professors or um, salaries that had been grant funded. Those were no longer going to be grant funded. So we had to get those in the budget. So you're starting to see there were a lot of things that we had to get in the budget somehow and without raising tuition, how are you going to do it? So Now, I might say on those economics positions, those were agreements when we accepted the grant monies that we agreed to that after the three-year bubble um, that we would pick those up on our books. So again, it's things that we have to do contractually. Um, let's see what else we had. We had, um, Michael and I had been working on uh, some kind of system to be able to have um, a pool of funds for the faculty to be able to um, replace positions or to add a position where there needed to be one because of the growth in the, uh, in the programming. Um, but it turns out that we had a more pressing problem, and that's the visiting professors. And all of you on the academic side, you're well aware of what we're talking about here. Um, these, um, these folks who are brought in to, uh, to help develop a program and to grow it, to see if it's going to take. And once it does, um, then we have, to, we have to keep those people. So we've got to have a pool of money to be able to bring those actually on to the faculty. So that was a really important important piece that we felt like we needed to keep in the budget. Um, so also we have some um, other non-faculty positions. We have a grant writer that we needed to be able to put in there. It's really critical to be able to get folks out there writing grants, and that was a piece that needed to be done. Um, we had a child services position, and really that is so little of the budget because they're really trading off uh, some funding that they had, but with uh, just a few other, a uh, few additional dollars they could put that um, in place. And then the online and non-track recruiter. We all know that the industry is going online. It's been going online for 20 years now. Uh, so it's nothing new, but we don't have a dedicated person to deal with those people who are not just online that we're trying to recruit and attract, but also non-traditional people, uh, people like me who might need to come back and get a, uh, get a, get a job in another field. Maybe, um, you know, maybe my job played out, uh, the company closed, what have you. We've got to have a way to go out and recruit those individuals. <coughs> and uh, so that's what that position's going to be for. We felt that that was a strategic position because that brings people into the university. And it's a small investment to hopefully um, bear some uh, you want to mention the purple text for digital. Why yeah. purple? Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. If you notice, the, there are some of these that are in purple, and those are the ones that were presented to the Strategic Budget Advisory Committee, and they were categorized by that, <coughs> by that group. So these were, um, many of these were initiatives brought up through the, the process of that um, funding request by the, the whole campus. So, on facilities, what are we going to use that five and a quarter for? Well, we're going to use it uh, for to help underwrite what we've already done, which is put a drain on the budget, and that's the people that need that we need to be able to maintain those buildings. So that's part of it. We've got um, utilities. That's uh, that's a pretty obvious one, and then the Department of Higher Education requirement that any any bonded building that we have has to have um, an amount that goes directly to um, a, a renovation account for that. It's an upkeep account for that building specifically. And uh, I think that was a great idea, but we have to be able to set that money aside every year. Um, with that building, it's $125,000. So, and then we also have the student success initiatives, and we've talked a little bit about these, the diversity, uh, the um, mentorship. I haven't talked about that. We have in the Department of Education, we have a student teacher mentorship program that needed to be uh, funded. It was one of these things that we've just been funding um, from temporary money and we needed to get that on the budget. And um, then of course the, um, the need-based aid services. And the whole 195 doesn't go to the need-based aid, which probably looks like it does. 
but it does um, go to serve all of those needs. So, did that balance the budget? No. <laughs> it, came, it came pretty close, with the exception of the scholarships. Um, we all know that we have, um, we're in a position that we need to make a hard look. We have to take a hard look at our scholarships and the way we offer those and, the, and try to decide what, who we're trying to attract, um, how we want to compete both in-state with our uh, sister institutions as well as how we want to compete nationwide and maybe even internationally. Uh, so we're at, we're at kind of a pivotal point here. Uh, we are making some changes in the scholarship program, very minor changes that we think is going to help um, help us underwrite these, these scholarships until we can make some major moves. Uh, so what we're doing is we're taking, uh, at the end of the year, we generally have money left over and we roll it into, um, into plan funds to cover projects and uh, uh, the academic areas have money for capital carryover. The non-academic uh, areas also have some capital carryover funds but to help underwrite some of these needs that we have that we can't fit into our regular budget or that they're just one time. Um, so the first 1.9 million on this year's year in money will go to help pay for the entering scholarships for FY, for fall of 18. So this is what it looks like. It's a lot of numbers. <laughs> And I didn't think y'all want to spend a whole lot of time on that. So I just wanted to show you the picture. This is going to be in the budget book. Uh, it will go online. When will the budget book go online? Oh, June 15th? Right around June 15th. Right. Maybe a little bit before. Okay, a little bit before June 15th. That's when it's due to stay. So what's it going to do to the students? This is, this is the impact it's going to have on them just for the um, just for the tuition piece, it's going to be $227 on an annual basis, and that's for students taking 15 hours. And then you see the room and board changes that we've made. And so if they're in 15 hours, they're in housing, they have a meal plan, then the uh, estimated amount that they'll pay additional is $563 a year. So where do we stand now with the other institutions? And this one's interesting because it's changing as we speak. So, and I don't, I don't think I have a pointer here. So you see we are currently in the dark purple. That's where we are now. Uh, the purple, the lavender, just to the left, that's where the proposed budget was, the tuition increase that the board approved at the last meeting. Um, so we didn't change at all on where we were ranked with the other institutions. But we do know, we've been tracking what's been going on with the others. We're probably still going to be either four, five, or six. We're going to be in that range because we've already, we've already watched what, what the other campuses are doing. UALR has jumped above Arkansas. So right now, the way I've looked at it, it is UALR, Arkansas and Arkansas Tech. So those are the top three right now. We don't know what ASU is going to do, uh, but we were we would be right behind Arkansas Tech at this point. And then on the bottom end, um, they're they're still pretty close on those uh, on the lower end ones. Henderson jumped up. SAU really jumped up. Matter of fact, they are right behind us now. So it kind of depends on what ASU is going to do to see to see where we all end up. But you can see we're still well positioned, even with this increase. And here we are with uh, tuition and fees and room and board. So if you put the whole package together, um, you still see how well positioned we are just right in the middle. Um, there are still people, members of my family included, who uh, tell me that we're the most expensive school in the state. And you can see that that's not true. I spent a long time at a Sunday picnic trying to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. I told them I wish I brought my charts. So I could have shown them. <laughs> so let's hear some discussion. Anybody have any questions? Ms. Diane, how do we compare to 
local, like Hendrix or CDC? How do we compare that to the other? Well, now that's really a different ballgame. That's okay. a good question. <laughs> they're, they're private institutions. And so, of course, they don't get any of the state money, so they have a much higher tuition um, tuition rate. They're a, a good rule of thumb for most students. <coughs> oh. That last chart, actually, can you back it up for a second? In some ways, that's a pretty good rule of thumb for what a cost of attendance figure would be. That's tuition, room, and board if someone were full-time as a student and living on campus with a meal plan. I mean, that's what that statistic is. A good rule of thumb to compare public to private is that private is usually four times greater than those figures. So take that, we're around 15,000 for the whole kit and caboodle for a year. Most private institutions are somewhere between 50 and 60,000. So and I, I know the Hendricks is in that range. I don't want to speak to what CDC is, um, but, but a good rule of thumb is four times. Um, trying to think about how to answer uh, the question without it sounding negative toward the legislature. So I'm going to answer it starting with all 50 states um, because I've got Tennessee, Oklahoma, Georgia now here um, to be able to compare to. Over the last two decades, um, generally most states, it's not been that they don't support higher education. It's been that three things have affected the ability of states to fund higher education. Number one has been um, corrections uh, reform, uh, it, whether it be legislation or court cases. Um, the dollars that come off the top because of basically court settled agreements for how corrections have to be funded. Number two, um, during that period of time, is the rising health care cost um, gobbling up uh, most uh, new available state dollars. And then a third thing that most states have dealt with is basic education equalization at K-12 level. It's basically where smaller school systems have made arguments, um, and then all 50 states did copycat crimes of those uh, court cases to, to get equalization funding from the state to be able to make up for the fact that some local school districts don't have the ability to tax their citizenry to be able to get up to um, what they would call an optimum level of effort on K-12. So I say all that, here's the, the punchline to all that. Over the last two decades, nine out of every 10 new dollars that are coming into state coffers have been gobbled up by one of those three things either corrections, health care, or K-12 equalization. So you really are down to the one dollar that gets spread to every other area of state government. And what's happened with higher education, and this has been true in all four of my states, is that it's become the balance wheel that they've looked and said, well, you've got the ability to raise tuition and fees, so therefore our effort from the state is going to go down and the effort from students has to come up. Presently, and this is where I'm going to say this really is a glass of sack full, I was delighted when I was applying for this job to see that the state of Arkansas still picks up 38 cents and students are responsible for 62 cents. Um, in Tennessee, that number is now 25 cents from the state, 75 from the students. And in Oklahoma, it's now 19 cents from the state um, and 81 cents uh, from the students. Georgia's a little bit of an outlier. It's still close to 50-50. That just, they were very lucky with a string of governors that just held the line when they were still funding 75% from the state. So they didn't experience in 2000, 2001, 2002 the cuts that came to most um, state higher education systems. And then therefore the cuts that came in 2007, 2008, 2009 with that recession didn't hit Georgia quite as hard of, because you know, again, they didn't deal with 20 years of adjustments. They really have dealt with seven years of adjustments. Um, I say this. Um, it's a victory that higher education had $10 million of new money um, put forward in the name of the new funding formula adoption. Uh, that's the $563,000 um, that we received. Again, we maximized our available um, amount of that $10 million. But again, $10 million, again, it's peanut butter spread very thinly between all the higher education institutions. We're glad to have it. Um, but as, as you saw, that's money that does not go very far. 
I think what we first want to be able to do at the state level is to be able to, at the very least, protect the investment that exists. Because again, I, I'm, I'm glad this has been filmed, the grass is not always green on the other side. I mean, my, my colleagues in Tennessee and Oklahoma, especially Oklahoma, they are really hurting right now because of disinvestment in higher ed. Um, we're very lucky we're still at 38%. Um, I think that there's every intention with the new funding formula, especially uh, because the messaging on the formula is it's really looking to uh, fund, it's, it's still an enrollment driven formula, it's outcomes, but it's productive enrollments, it's, it's funding institutions that are having success serving students, it's, it's getting students um, not only through to graduation, but through critical checkpoints along the way in a timely manner to be able to save money for the students and save money for the state. Um, we're set up to thrive under that new funding formula. I would love it if we could go back in an era where there was a lot of new money for higher education having that new formula because I think UCA would really uh, be able to rake it in. But as it is, I do feel good about the future when new state dollars are available. Um, we are well positioned to be able to claim not only our share, but maybe a little more. Um, I, the big picture, um, again, I, I, I don't want to say because I have the ability to look at it relative to some of our sister states. Um, I feel very fortunate that we're still at 38%. Um, that number could be a lot lower. Um, but obviously, it has a lot to do with our ability to be able to serve students and keep tuition and fee increase off. I could speak to the year-end funds as it relates to the SBAC request that came through for those year-end funds. We really won't know how much we have until probably August when we close the book and make all those what we call topside entries that, uh, that you have to wait until the very end of the year to do. And I'm sure Jeremy's grinning at me right now. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> but, um, so we won't really know, but we are gathering that data. We have it. Um, it's a good list. I like the way that it was categorized rather than just um, prioritized. Um, but we're going to go down the list and we're going to do as much as we can. Um, we'll probably have, right now we're looking at about 6.2 million. Of course, 1.9 comes off the top. Um, and then there are some other priorities that, that, um, that are going to be in that mix too that didn't even go through um, the process. They're just things that we have to do. Um, uh, but I think it was a good process. I know Larry was happy. Some of his um, some of his needs got on that list as well. Um, so did that answer your question, or was there more specific? We really just won't know until about August, and then that's when we'll we'll start getting that taken care of. Anything else? Some of you might have questions, and by all means, um, as, we, as we break up here in just a moment, we'll be glad, Diane, I think you're fine. We can, if you just want to ask a question on the side, if you even want to ask in front of the group, we'll hang around as long as we need to. Um, look, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, I know some of you um, maybe weren't even scheduled to be on campus on this particular day, and you made a special effort uh, to make a trip in. Thank you for that. Uh, for those of you that are on our nine-month um, contracts, that, that would be true of. Um, but by all means, uh, we are uh, recording this and we'll make it available. We'll put it out on the web uh, for those that were not able uh, to attend. Um, and we'll, we'll try and, uh, as we look toward the various campus talks next year, we'll try and think about if there are some of those that can become budget additions um, as well, because I think it's important that we include as many people as possible in the dialogue. So thank you very much for coming out. And go Bears!